Okay. I think we are, everybody is in. So I will start now with the session. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night to everybody. My name is uh, Barbara Galetti, Technical Advisor to Chile's Delegation at the IWC and convener of the Conservation Committee Intersessional Working Group on Cetacean and Ecosystem Functioning. It is a pleasure to be here with so many familiar and new faces chairing this workshop during the upcoming days. First of all, I would like to thank everybody for attending the workshop on socioeconomic value of the contribution of cetaceans to ecosystem functioning. I would also like to particularly thank the IW Secret Secretariat and all the staff for the excellent and enormous work in organizing this event. Also, many thanks to Vicky James, DJ Schubert, and Maria Clara Jimenez who have volunteered to act as rapporteur. And most importantly, we are incredibly grateful to the excellent speakers. They will contribute with their expertise to advancing these essential yet emerging topics related to cetacean research, the marine environment, and ultimately the entire life on earth. These issues are becoming increasingly relevant in the face of the climate emergency and the global fisheries crisis. Non-lethal research of whales, an activity that flourished after the International Whaling Commission adopted a global moratorium on commercial whaling more than 30 years ago, is showing today the critical role cetaceans plays in the functioning of the marine ecosystems including carbon sequestration and primary productivity. These findings are relatively new when the first scientific research was published a little more than a decade ago, back in 2010. The topic has been gaining momentum after the IWC became the first international organization to recognize the importance of cetaceans in the functioning of the ecosystem. In 2016, the IWC adopted the resolution 2016 number three on cetaceans and their contribution to ecosystem functioning that resolved to review the ecological, management, environmental, social, and economic aspects related to the contribution of cetaceans to ecosystem functioning, to people and natural systems as a matter of importance. The Commission also directed the Conservation Committee to undertake this review and asked the Scientific Committee to screen existing studies and develop a research gap analysis. In 2018, the Commission adopted a second resolution on advancing the Commission's work on the role of cetacean in the ecosystem functioning that further strengthened the IWC work on this topic. Last year, the IWC conducted a joint workshop with the, with the Convention on Migratory Species to review scientific gaps and other aspects of the roles of cetacean in the ecosystem functioning. It reviewed current knowledge regarding nutrient circulation, ocean fertilization, whale falls, and trophic cascade. However, let me tell you no more since one of our distinguished speakers will make a detailed presentation on its primary outcomes. In addition, the Commission also endorsed a proposal to do a workshop on the socioeconomic value of the contribution of cetaceans to the ecosystem functioning. Today, we are here to conduct this second workshop. Thanks to the implementation of both workshops, we will be able to understand better the contribution of cetacean to ecosystem functioning from a scientific, biological, and ecosystem perspective and from an economical and social dimension. Especially important is that the recognition of the IWC of this topic is beginning to spread outside of this international organization. 
The Convention of Migratory Species adopted a resolution on this topic in 2017 and expressed its interest in cooperating with the IWC Scientific Committee in the joint workshop. The International Monetary Fund affirmed in 2019 that the strategy to protect whales could limit greenhouse gases and global warming. More recently, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has also integrated the role of these wildlife species into its agenda. Worldwide, there are increasing strategies to incorporate these concepts into management schemes, and several multilateral organisms are exploring nature-based solutions to overcome current crises. The shifting of a paradigm in the management and conservation of nature is becoming a powerful mechanism to facilitate the recovery and long-term conservation of biodiversity. It sees nature not merely has resources to be exploited to their maximum sustainable yields, but has active contributors to the healthy functioning of the planetary ecosystems and mitigators of the negative impacts generated by human activities. Nevertheless, this paradigm shift requires international cooperation and political will. With this workshop, we look forward to contributing to these efforts. We expect that during these three days, we can learn about current advances in the socioeconomic valuation of the marine environment and cetaceans, and propose strategies that will facilitate the conservation of these species and strengthen the resilience of marine ecosystems. I will now stop this reflection. I would like to introduce you to the IW6 Secretariat, Ms. Rebecca Lent. Thank you very much, Barbara, and hello, everyone. It's great to see you. I'm sorry it's not in person, but we will make up for that, certainly, when we are beyond this pandemic. I have to say that I share Barbara's enthusiasm for this topic ever since I heard about the whale pump from Joe Roman and then read the exciting research at IMF with Ralph Shami and his colleagues. I've been really following this closely. Today's workshop is particularly exciting to me because some of you may know I'm actually trained as a marine economist. And um, although I'm not working as a marine economist anymore, I'm a recovering economist, so I still have this point of view on the world, and I think it brings a, a good perspective to mix with the biology, and that's certainly reflected in the expert panel that we have for bycatch at IWC. So I want to thank everyone for joining this workshop, because some biologists, when you say socioeconomics, they run screaming for the door. It sounds awful. It sounds like profits. It sounds like we don't care about the animals. We only care about people, but nothing could be further from the truth. It's about finding the true values, the true costs and benefits of healthy cetacean populations, including non-market values. I think this helps us reach better decisions and do a better job of putting uh, mitigation measures as well as monitoring in place. So um, I wanna thank Barbara for leading this effort. I wanna thank our many speakers and all of you for being here. And I look forward to an exciting workshop. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Len. It is indeed a fascinating workshop and hopefully it will help us improve our conservation strategy for cetaceans and marine ecosystems. I will now give some very brief details on the Zoom. I know everybody has been for very several years now uh, working virtually, but just to remind you that when you introduce yourself or talk for the first time, please give your name and affiliation so everybody knows you. And if you want to uh, have a question, please raise the hand below on the screen of the, on the participant screen. And uh, don't use the chat unless it's for technical uh, issues that you would like to contact Mosa from the IWC staff. Uh, the workshop will be conducted today, tomorrow, and next Monday, 11 April. Each session will last three hours between 3 and 6 p.m. England time. It's being live streamed via the YouTube channel of the IWC, where it will be available for a short time in case some participants cannot be present at all sessions. 
there is also a SharePoint site where participants can download background information. At this SharePoint, you can find the draft agenda that was circulated. And I would like to ask if there is any comment on the draft agenda. I can see no raised hand. So it seems no. I think we can adopt the agenda. Today's sessions will focus on identifying contributions that could be addressed from the social and economics perspective. To achieve this, we will have a presentation by Dr. Toshihi Kitakato on the outcomes of the IWC CMS scientific workshop on cetacean and ecosystem function. We will also broaden the scope into marine megafauna with a presentation by Dr. David Tavares, and we will deepen it with Mr. Marco Javorsek that will introduce us into the United Nations system of environmental economic accounting. We will finalize the session with an open discussion to identify which and how these services have or have been not been addressed from a social economical perspective. I now want to welcome Dr. Toshihiri Kitakato. Dr. Kitakato works at the Department of Marine Bioscience at Tokyo University. He's also convener of the IWC Scientific Committee Ecosystem Modeling Subcommittee and was co-chair of the IWC CMS workshop. He will present its main outcome today. Good evening for you, Dr. Kitakato. I know it's late for you now, and thank you for being here, and please take the floor. Thank you, Barbara. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you, and I can see the presentation. Thank you. Just a moment. Let me uh, turn off my video. Just a moment. Yes. Once again. Okay. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, again, I'm, I'm Toshi Kitakado from Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. Actually, I'm a former chair of the scientific committee of the IWC from 2012 to 2015. And since then, I have been the convener of the working group on ecosystem modeling in the scientific committee. And first of all, uh, thank you, Chair, for giving me an opportunity for the brief report of the outcomes of the IWC CMS workshop held virtually in April last year, which was uh, presided over the Fabian Ritter and myself. And so let me uh, report on behalf of the co-chairs. Okay, now to, uh, as uh, Barbara mentioned, that there are two existing resolutions uh, related to the ecosystem functioning, uh, cetacean ecosystem functioning, and I'm not going to details about uh, their background and contents, but quickly, <clears throat> uh, resolution 2016-3 provided a broad range of the scope on ecosystem functioning of cetacean, such as uh, contributions of carbon storage by live whales, and contributions by foil falls for carbon export and the biodiversity in the deep seas, and contribution for the carbon sequestration in the regulating the atmospheric CO2 levels, and contribution as uh, top predators in the ecosystem. And also there are contribution to the nutrient availability. So there are a number of different kinds of the uh, contributions made by the live cetaceans as well and the carcasses. And then the commission uh, encouraged uh, constru contracting uh, government to work uh, constructively in regulating and supporting ecosystem functioning with reviewing the ecological management, environmental, social, and economical aspects related to the contributions of cetaceans to ecosystem as a matter of the importance. So with that, 
And in order that the commission can decide to increase collaboration and cooperation to work on the cetacean contributions, commissions uh, finally tasked the SC to uh, conduct several works as shown on the screen, like uh, further incorporate the uh, contribution made by the live cetaceans to ecosystem functioning into one of the SC works to screen the existing research studies on the contribution of cetaceans to ecosystem functioning and to develop a gap analysis regarding the research and to develop a plan for remaining research needs. The SG, especially the working group on ecosystem modeling has been discussing how the SG can proceed with those tasks and they defined the TOR for the uh, workshop as shown here, as well as some working hypotheses so that SC can address and identify the necessary items to discuss. So we are trying to make some uh, quantitative analysis and identify any gap, gaps. So with these uh, preparations, uh, originally the workshop was planned to be held in 2021 in person format, because of the effectiveness of such a meeting format for dedicated discussion, including the quantitative works. But the situation didn't allow us to do that. So as an initial step, uh, we decided to hold a three days uh, virtual session, four and a half hour each, to start to review existing scientific information so that we can uh, continue the rest of the work over the course of the following years and to follow the uh, second workshop in person. <coughs> so this is a, a list of agenda items which we used for the workshop. And after some uh, usual uh, introductory items, the workshop received uh, two keynote reviews by uh, Dr. Roma and by the team of the Dr. Bassman which were followed by the uh, several presentations by the several invited experts over the specific topics on fire force, nutrient saturation and ocean fertilization, and cetacean as a predators and so on. And we, so we have uh, once broadened the uh, scientific scopes and then we had a general discussion regarding the way forward. And as a general uh, issue, uh, the workshop received uh, key concepts and issues to be taken, uh, including uh, whale falls, uh, which are sunken carcasses of whales at the sea floor, and which contribute to the uh, diversity and evolution for the deep sea species, as well as the carbon sequestration, and foil pump which is kind of the uh, vertical movement from uh, movement process from bottom to surface, which contribute to the recycling of the nutrients in addition to the uh, horizontal nutrient vector type of the uh, contributions. And also the carbon cycling, storage and sequestration, and also the physical engineering, uh, like a sediment to suspension by the feeding uh, activities and also the bubble net for the uh, foraging, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and a uh, lot of the uh, predators and prey in the population dynamics. So uh, these are kind of the several uh, general discussions uh, uh, addressed by the uh, several uh, presentations, and also the another uh, general aspects uh, from the uh, different angles. Uh, the what roles cetacean play is, uh, we identify the what role cetacean play is largely dependent on the scale from the local to global. And there are uh, possible variation in the roles in space and time. And there are uh, possible differences in the magnitude of contributions over the different species. And there might be some uh, impact of the population declines on the roles and uh, contribution of cetaceans to the ecosystem functioning. And uh, similarly, that there might be another impact of climate changes on the roles and contributions. In addition to these uh, general uh, issues, here I only uh, bring a couple of uh, specific issues 
but there are uh, observations of the variation in roles in space, like a, a different importance of the foil pump between the Southern Ocean and North Pacific or Atlantic Ocean. And also there, are, uh, there is another kind of the variation in time, such as a different frequencies in foil falls over different eras, as Passman et al. showed. And another specific example was reported for the uh, Southern Ocean. And in those researches, an intermediate complexity level of the ecosystem modeling was conducted for key species in the Southern Ocean with consideration of the play availability, play availability and climate changes. And the results showed that uh, carbon sink was estimated to have dramatically declined due to the wetting, and then a great increase in the future sea exploration were projected over the 21st century under the assumption of with and without climate change impacts on oil numbers. And these results suggested that the effect is two times as different. And such modeling could also uh, investigate different nutrient uh, cycling over time. And this uh, comprehensive work uh, conducted in the Southern Ocean has not been conducted yet areas other than Southern Ocean by the OSAS, but it looks like uh, worth comparing to see if there are any uh, different patterns or effects over the space. And then in order to uh, wrap up the discussion, the workshop established a series of tables to capture the outcomes of the workshop. And these tables were uh, intended to uh, provide an overview and the balanced representation of the, what is known and also intended to uh, identify uh, knowledge gaps. The first table is table one, a summary of selected traits of cetaceans and their related ecosystem functioning services. And this uh, is a, a big table of the seven pages, since it provide it tries to provide a comprehensive overview of the existing knowledge about cetacean ecosystem functioning and services. So uh, I just extracted a small portion of the table for the three different components for your reference. And uh, this is just a small extract for the uh, nutrient transfer and circulations. And so there are trade, description, function, services, example, as well as the uh, some useful references. And similar uh, table uh, was, uh, sorry, and second section in the green text is for the uh, feeding related traits. And one more section in blue text is for the provision of the habitat contribution to biodiversity and blue carbons. And as I mentioned, uh, this is a very much big table over the seven pages. So uh, please take a look at the with your uh, interest. And another big table uh, <coughs> is table two, uh, which is to set out the research needed to improve our knowledge of the effects of cetaceans on ecosystem functionings. Again, uh, there are uh, three uh, components with the different uh, colors of the text. And first one is the uh, uh, nutrition, uh, nutrient transfer and circulation. And there are uh, recommended research with some uh, hypothesis or questions. That's very much useful for the science. And also another section in the big table for the feeding ground, uh, feeding ready trays. And so also the one more section uh, for the uh, provisions habitat and contribution to biodiversity and blue carbons. So similar uh, type of the, uh, sorry, uh, we have a uh, three sections like in the table one. So uh, we had a, a great discussion about the different topics as well as the uh, specific and generals. And of course, from the scientific point of view, uh, it would be uh, great uh, to extend our scopes and the scientific needs for the different directions. But we also need to respond to the commission with some answers. So uh, the workshop uh, 
try to uh, develop a list of general questions and hypotheses with some uh, specific tasks, which focus on the, what could be achieved within a short term for a second workshop. And the first uh, item is uh, development of the, or modification of the existing ecosystem models for the basis of the subsequent items. And as you recognize, uh, to conduct the, some quantitative analysis, uh, reviewing the existing ecosystem model is an essential step. And depending on it, uh, we need to uh, discuss uh, development and the modification uh, of them uh, with consideration of sub-items shown as some bullet points here. And also another key uh, factor, uh, several inputs uh, are needed as an underlying information to proceed with the work. And it seems that is, uh, and so the list of, in the second section item it seems that the to cover the somewhat broad topics and questions listed in the previous two tables, table one and table two. That said, uh, depending on the availability of information and data, we may be able to uh, sort them out for uh, some extent, uh, to some extent, and for some items. And the third and the fourth ones are for the some evaluation of the difference or changes of ecosystem functioning over the space and time. Actually, I have somewhat highlighted those topics in my previous slide, but the third one is the uh, quantification of spatial difference in ecosystem functioning of cetaceans with focus on the link with the environment and the regional ecosystem characteristics, like a historical trend in the different places and which could uh, uh, include the uh, case studies in some areas like a Southern Ocean, South Pacific, Eastern North Pacific, North Atlantic, including Barents Sea and Gulf of Maine and other, uh, other oceans and uh, seas that are nutrient uh, limited. And also uh, contrast areas where the cetaceans utilize different forest species and the functional groups like a uh, uh, creel, a fish, a benthic invertebrates, or it, etc., and to contrast ecosystem models of the northern hemisphere versus southern hemisphere. So there, this is a, a third one, and also fourth one is the quantification of the temporal change in ecosystem functioning of cetaceans, with focus on the difference between uh, prevailing and current populations, and identification of the information and knowledge gap. Again, there might be some different level of the temporal changes over time. So the uh, third and the fourth ones can be uh, actually uh, interconnected. And the rest of the two items in the table three uh, cover another uh, important aspect of the global changes and the different contributions over the different species and the functional groups, including the baleen and the toothed whales. So uh, this is the list of the table three, which we created. And then uh, there is another table in report, which was actually uh, not well discussed uh, during the workshop. Rather, uh, this is just a, a preliminary level of a template for a summary. And these will be uh, further discussed and modified in the second workshop. So this is just a preliminary uh, template. But uh, this kind of table might be uh, useful to convey the, our scientific activities uh, on the evaluation of the ecosystem functioning of, uh, of cetaceans. Uh, so we can, we can develop and we can uh, tweak and polish the table if necessary. Continue one. Okay, and then let me, let me go back to the uh, element of table three. So as I mentioned, uh, there are a total of the six uh, main items, like uh, from first one to the sixth one. <laughs> and it's in the SC last year, uh, just after the workshop, uh, it identified the further needs uh, to narrow the scope or narrow down the scope 
of the uh, task to be uh, completed before the second workshop and the need to expand the area of the forecast beyond the Southern Ocean to include other areas to see if there is a contrasting information. So uh, we are focusing attention on temporal spatial dynamics of cetacean and ecosystem functioning as in the items uh, three and four of the table in the workshop report like this. And our aim is to uh, focus on the Southern Ocean and the North Atlantic <coughs> and where there might be a richer information than other areas in a global scale. When we may also cover the uh, small uh, scale of the areas uh, where appropriate or in terms of the uh, availability of time and data. And for way forward, uh, some tasks need to be done uh, to prepare for uh, some key inputs, but work has been uh, delayed. So we uh, really discuss more concrete timeline and roadmap for the uh, increasing for increasing the success likelihood for this important works at the uh, this year's scientific committee, which are coming over the um, several weeks, uh, and then also the I think the uh, collaboration and inputs from the uh, conservation committee might be helpful and also useful. So finally, taking this opportunity, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the attendees, including the invitees, SG members, steering group members, and observers, and also the IWC staffs for uh, helpful as usual. And a special thanks to the two keynote speakers, Dr. Roma and the Basman, and also the other invited speakers as well as the two main reporters, uh, DJ and Vicky, sorry for calling their first name now. And also this workshop was uh, co-hosted by the IWC and CMS. So we appreciate them. And we also thank the funding supports from several bodies shown here. So uh, this is a, a quick rundown for the uh, first workshop. And uh, 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 we are looking forward to holding the uh, second workshop in person. So uh, thank you, Chair, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toshi, for such an excellent presentation on the scientific aspect related to cetacean and ecosystem functioning. Although we know current knowledge is fundamental, there is also an overwhelming amount of aspects that are still yet to be discovered through the non-lethal research of cetacean and will certainly highlight even more the importance of the various contributions they are providing. We will come back to the scientific committee workshop report to understand the extent of this contribution and translate it into the socioeconomic fields during these days. So it's very important the scientific committee report. It is uh, included in the uh, SharePoint also, so uh, all participants can go and uh, read it with the, in today. I will now open the floor for questions and comment. We will especially work over uh, these uh, sessions on the table one, on the traits of the scientific committee workshop report has there, it, uh, it shows all the threats and, the and each threat associated to the uh, ecosystem services provided. And then we will have to get a brainstorm to know if they have been or haven't been really addressed from a socioeconomic perspective. Mm -hmm. So, we need to understand all these concepts and traits to associate them with any particular uh, socioeconomic contribution while we are developing the workshop. And uh, next, uh, we'll be presenting our David uh, from, from Marine Megafauna Threat. So it will also uh, contribute to the same kind of discussion. So please uh, don't be shy if you have any question or comment, this is your time. If this is the first time you address the audience, please remember to briefly introduce yourself, including any affiliation you 
wish to acknowledge. It is very late for Toshi now, so perhaps he will be leaving uh, after he presents. So it's time now for having uh, uh, any questions for clarification about the, the scientific committee reports and uh, the workshop threads. I see a hand from Marcelo Hernandez Blanco, who will also be a distinguished speaker tomorrow. Hi, Marcelo. Hi, Please how are take you? The floor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thanks for the introduction and for the announcement that we're going to present tomorrow. I hope everybody uh, can attend tomorrow. And uh, perhaps I don't know if this is the moment to ask this question, but looking at all of that framework and, and different tables that are all you know interrelated, I was thinking how much have you thought of how this is going to fit into the policy arena, right? We're, we want to develop all this research. And since we're speaking about ecological functions, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that we are going to start thinking about what's next, which is ecosystem services, which is also kind of tricky saying, well, ecosystem services, because a well is not an ecosystem. But my point is that, ha have you thought about how all this integrates with the policy and the financial arena? Because uh, we've, we've done it for several other species and ecosystems, and it would be quite interesting to see how all this knowledge is gonna fit to propose new policy and financial mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcelo. Uh, I think this is uh, one of the objectives of this workshop. Uh, the, when the IWC adopted the resolutions, it was exactly, uh, I, the spirit was to better understand and that's why he, the scientific committee needed to make an effort to uh, translate all the scientific knowledge into the uh, decision-making uh, persons of each government through the IWC. So we can get this knowledge. And with this workshop, we want to dig onto how to translate the scientific knowledge, uh, the whale, uh, do thesis with the thesis uh, contribute to the primary productivity, how you translate that into socioeconomic value. And then there is the third big step, how if we have an economical value, how we get a financial mechanism, which I think many of you, uh, the expert, expert that will speak over these days have worked through. And we think we will get with very interesting ideas out of this workshop, but currently we don't have the answers to know how this will translate to the policy arena. And it's up to this workshop to find this, this, this way and these uh, relations. Okay, thank you, Barbara. And please count on me for whatever I can help you in, in, in from that front. Thank you. Ah, Toshi. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barbara. And also, uh, uh, not to uh, Marcel's point is not to uh, my uh, presentation, but uh, I think the uh, comments made by Marcel is very much important for the uh, scientific activities and the scientific committee because the, of course, uh, we just had a, a kickoff meeting or initial meeting as a workshop uh, to address the what we need to go and what we need to uh, uh, cover as a scientific topics. And uh, so we are trying to make some quantification for the some aspect for the evaluation of the uh, uh, ecosystem uh, functioning and contributions. But uh, if you, the matter of the concern is like a, uh, some translation from the scientific uh, information to the uh, uh, economic information for the uh, developing the policy making. What kind of the uh, information, uh, quantitative information, 
uh, for the scientific committee is needed is a good question for us. And that kind of the uh, information might be useful for, the, for our further work. So uh, these kind of the uh, inputs are maybe uh, uh, useful for the, uh, our scientific activities, uh, scientific committee's activity. Just my uh, small comment, thank you. Thank you, uh, Toshi, for pointing this out. I, if I am right, and I'm, I may, maybe Imogen can answer after, we will be presenting to the scientific committee a short summary, not the entire report because it won't be done, but to this uh, scientific committee meeting for information. Uh, Rebecca, please. Yes, thank you very much. Just a quick comment. I think this is a good discussion saying, where do we take this research? And um, how does it get folded into policy? Like a lot of the things that we do in science and conservation at IWC, much of it is beyond our specific mandate, which is managing whaling. But we can take this information, such as potential solutions to bycatch or economic contributions of cetaceans, we can take them to the very fora where people are looking at things like, what are the benefits of reducing bycatch? What are the benefits of reducing ship strikes? It's not just um, the benefits in terms of reducing mortality of cetaceans, but it can bring these other benefits, the contributions of cetaceans to ecosystems. So like all the other science that we do, we prepare that, we pack it up and we give it to the very agencies that can make a difference. I'm really pleased, uh, by the way, to see that CMS are with us today <clears throat> but the, the FAO, the IMO, all these other organizations, that's an important part of what we do. So, and, and I believe that uh, Ralph Shami tomorrow will be talking a little bit about this phenomenon of how you take these financial figures and use them as ammunition, if you will, to get policy changes in the appropriate arenas. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Is someone else that want to take the floor? Mm -hmm. It seems no. So thank you all for your interesting questions and Toshi for the clarity in your presentation. We are now, seems 15 to I don't know what time is it in the UK, but uh, to uh, quarter before uh, 4 p.m. The break was at 4 p.m. So I am not sure if we make the break now or if Davi uh, it's uh, at the room because I think he will join us later. He didn't have time to arrive earlier. Is it right? Uh, yes, Barbara. Uh, Davi had a very set schedule for us, unfortunately. So we will have to have either perhaps um, have a look at the table as a group. Maybe we could share it now so that people perfect. can start thinking about it. Okay, perfect. So this is part of the work we will be conducting uh, late this uh, session. And we will go through the table the table number one about the threats of the scientific committee meeting. Uh, can, Barbara, uh, would you like me to share my screen right now? Yes, please. Okay. So then we can have an idea of what will be our work after the presentations have finished. It's a very long list of traits. So she has already pointed out seven pages, but it's very interesting. You can find the, you can already, it's already uploaded into the SharePoint. So you can download this Excel table. Thank you, DJ, I can see the information. But, uh, could you zoom it a little bit more? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. You want me so, to make it, you want me to make it bigger? Yes, a okay. little bigger. Thank you. Okay. So this this is table one from the scientific committee report. Then for each uh, threat, meaning body size and latitude. And they have also a category. If it's nutrient transfer and circulation, this is the red ones, or if it's a feeding related threats, or if it's provision of habitat, contribution to biodiversity and blue carbon, it's the blue one. So at the scientific committee, they want in a very detailed and accurate list that we will, it's about 31 different traits. And we will try to fill this table, uh, think about it during this, at the end of this session, about what socioeconomic contribution is there or see if it has been already considered this threat or this contribution to the socioeconomic value. Tomorrow's session, after we have a very intense uh, overview of the different methods, valuation methods, we will uh, have a, a, a second round with this table to know which is the best approach or valuation method for this topic. Uh, sorry, Robert Johnson, you have uh, raised your hand. Please take the floor. Um, yeah, hi, my name is uh, Robert Johnston from Clark University. I'm an environmental economist. I'm going to be talking tomorrow. Um, just a, one uh, quick comment on this table. Um, uh, so this table looks very similar to tables that have been developed for a whole lot of different um, sorts of ecosystem functions, right? And we see these all the time when people think about various types of ecosystem services right and traits and how people value them and one um and, and tables like this are a fantastic starting point but once you get to moving from services to socioeconomic contributions you typically need something more i'm going to be talking about this really briefly in my talk tomorrow but essentially the what what these tables beg for is, I guess, what we typically call a causal chain or a means end ends diagram, because some of these different attributes affect people directly, many of them affect people indirectly, and, and, uh, and probably the majority of them might affect people both directly and indirectly, right? So you wind up with these fairly complex diagrams through which you trace the, you know, a particular cetacean to a particular range of ecosystem impacts. And those get linked to specific valued effects on specific beneficiaries. And without that level of detail, it uh, you, you can't take it to the next step, at least when you're thinking about a kind of rigorous economic valuation, because you don't know what that good or service or ecosystem um, that, that good or service specifically defined is, right? What is the exact thing that people are valuing? So for example, if you talk about vertical transport of nutrients, right? Well, for the most part, people don't value nutrient changes directly, right? They're gonna value the ecosystem impacts that come out of those nutrient impacts, right? And so what are those, right? Well, they might affect fisheries, they might affect you know, I, I tend to, to work more in, in freshwater environments, but if I'm thinking about nutrient impacts in freshwaters, I'm thinking about water clarity. I'm thinking about effects on fish, on species. And it's those things that are valued, not the initial nutrient effects, right? And so, so in to move to the next thing, what is the socioeconomic contribution and have these already been considered in, in socioeconomic models and what are the methods, you typically have to go beyond that services column to say, okay, how does how do the, the services we've got, we have listed here, are those the things that are valued directly or do they simply affect other things that are valued directly? So to build out that full means ends diagram or the set of ecological production functions necessary for us to move to whales, from whales or cetaceans, the ecosystem functions to the things that people value that we can quantify, right? And so 
just I, so this is a fantastic starting point, but my thought is to, to really think about socioeconomic contributions, we need another set of columns or graph or something in between. So just a thought. Thank you very much, Robert. That's just uh, the, the kind of discussion we should ha be having today and during the workshop because it's uh, the objective of the workshop to get there, to get to evaluate these threats and transform it into something meaningful. I was looking, for example, for it's a you, very straightforward to understand, for example, uh, the absorb the carbon sequestration, right? But there was uh, like a peeling, uh, like a sloth skin also mentioned in the workshop. So those are very interesting things because we don't know if this has been ever considered some, at some point. So I have the DJ and Marcello that has the, the race up. DJ, please uh, take the floor. Well, I thought that was a very interesting uh, comment and I'm just wondering, uh, if uh, there would be value in adding perhaps two columns after column G, the first could be um, uh, perhaps uh, the label could be something like, is the value direct or indirect? Uh, and the second could be uh, describing the direct or indirect value for these different traits. Would that help um, flush out those um, those comments that uh, that were made would, would would that be helpful to add to the table? I mean, I I'm not sure whether that that was to me or to the group. I mean, I think just my perspective is that I mean that would be a great start, and that it would at least put a placeholder there. My one uh, my one question there would be sometimes these effects can and I, I'm tomorrow I'm going to show just a simple means and diagram not for cetaceans but actually for forests because we developed it um, and these things there can be a whole lot of different indirect and indirect effects and so in some cases it might be really straightforward in other cases you might wind up with a really busy cell in the spreadsheet but I, I think at least that would would put a placeholder in that would say yeah we recognize that it's not that people for example value nutrient transport directly or that nutrient transport doesn't have a direct socioeconomic uh, socioeconomic impact but boy that nutrient transport might affect other things that have a whole lot of impacts and so what are those things so yeah i think that would help thank you uh, very much robert and dj for your suggestions uh, marcelo please sorry marcelo or marcelo it's, Mar it's marcelo so marcelo. My, my my mom is half italian so i i I get this complicated name, uh, okay. but um, just uh, building on, on what Robert was saying, I, I was wondering if it would be useful to have a, a column on who are the beneficiaries of, the, of these services, right? And this would also help us to prioritize which are the, the main services that we want to address through different uh, management strategies, right? So. Uh, that could be useful having who are the main beneficiaries and, and then another one. And on, on these beneficiaries, of course, we would have direct, indirect, global, like in the case of carbon, but also we could have more, you know, local or, or national. And then I don't know if it would be making it too complicated, but it would also help to have a more systemic view of, of these services um, on what other capitals, right? We're, we're talking about here about natural capital and natural capital here are the cetaceans, right? And the ocean, but how does this interact with human built and social capital to produce human well-being, right? Because at, at the end, what we want to show here through this cascade of functions and services, et cetera, and values, it's how cetaceans provides or helps in the functioning of an ocean that provides human well-being. And that human well-being is what we value through the economic methods, right? So I'm just I was just wondering if those two tables would help and if it doesn't make it too messy. Uh, but I think it's it's important to have that that perspective. Thank you. 
Thank you uh, very much, um, Marcelo. DJ, do you have your hand raised? Ah, <laughs> no. Okay, so thank you very much for your comments. I think we will go in, uh, DJ raised the hands again. Yeah, I apologize, Barbara, but uh, in terms of Marcelo's uh, two um, suggestions. I, I tried to capture one in column J, but Marcelo, can you provide um, some additional um, comments on your second suggestion and how I might phrase that column heading? Sure. Uh, I mean, I still don't know if it fits in this table, but it's uh, what capitals interact with this natural capital, for example, and, and I think I, I don't see any uh, cultural ecosystem services here because what we're talking about is about the, the functioning. But for example, in whale watching, right? So the, the ecosystem service provided, I would say by the ocean or the biodiversity service, although that doesn't exist in the literature, provided by whales, it's recreation. But you cannot get that benefit, that service, if you don't have the build capital to access the ocean and, and, and to go and see the whales, or if you don't have the human capital that knows where the whales are and who values the whales and are willing to pay to go to see the whales. And see, I'm introducing here now the, the most economic um, you know, characteristic, which is the willingness to pay, and that it's, it's interacts with, with these other capitals. Uh, Again, I don't know if it fits here, but I think it's part of this systemic point of view that we have to keep in mind. So when we develop the management strategies to make visible these values provided by whales, we, we can have a, a very integrated policy or, yeah, or, or mandate. Well, thank you for that. Um, as economics is not my forte, can you, um, suggest some text I could put here in column, the new column K just as a placeholder? I would say uh, type, types of capital that interact with this service. It, types of capital? Yeah. Uh, but, but again, I, I would put it there just in case if the rest of the group thinks this could be useful. I don't know if from Robert's remarks, uh, this makes sense. Uh, yeah. I have, I have placed it in brackets uh, to suggest that it's uh, still open to discussion. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your suggestions. I think we are already on time. It's almost at 4 p.m. in the UK. I uh, don't think we will have time to go through all this. Now someone is uh, Os Osmar uh, requesting the, the floor, no? It seems not. And so I will suggest to have a break for 20 minute breaks and we reconvene at 4.20. And then we will come back with the presentation from uh, Ben Davi and also from uh, Marco Davi Tavares and Marco Javorsek before moving back again to this, uh, to this starting point with the threats of whales and, uh, and, 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 the, and the table and this, the association to the socioeconomic values. So just reconvene in uh, 20 more minutes so you can have a break and a cup of coffee or tea. Thank you.
atas.
Hello, everybody. I hope you had a good uh, a good break. You could have a rest and take a little coffee, as I did. Um, someone is requesting live transcription. I think it's okay to have live transcription if there is no problem for any other in the room. So yes, we will have uh, some live transcription, so it's easier to follow the discussions for other people. So I think it has been a very uh, interesting and productive first part of the first session. So she gave us the introduction for those who are joining later uh, on the scientific committee workshop outcomes. Um, and we have been reviewing the table that we will work through with interesting comments from Robert Johnson and uh, Marcelo Hernandez. Um, now we will continue with the agenda item that are currently, we were waiting for Mr. Davy, Davy Tavares. So I would like to invite Davy Tavares to present about threats shared by marine megafauna and their relationship with ecosystem functions and services. Dr. Tavares works at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research. He is interested in understanding how biological diversity responds to both natural and human induced changes in tropical coastal environments. Thank you very much, Dr. Tavares, for your work and for sharing it with us today. Hello. Thank you for the invitation, first of all. Can you hear me? Is everything working well? Can you also see the slides? Yes, thank Very you. Good. So, yeah, that was a paper that I was writing together with uh, collaborators of the ZMT, the Zentrum for Marine Tropenforschung in Bremen, in north of Germany. And actually was a parallel project that we started to do like a hobby because we have a large data set on stranded uh, dolphins, whales, seabirds, and sea turtles in the coast of Brazil, more specifically in Rio de Janeiro. And we work as well with functional diversity, of course. <clears throat> so analyzing this data, then we could find patterns and we decided to write like a paper about okay, how to unify, how to standardize all the traits shared by marine megafauna to make it like this research area standardized with all the areas of trait biology. Uh, let's move forward. Well, first of all, it's important to define what is marine, what is marine megafauna because a kind of a chaos in the definition of this group. Well, all those animals here, that I'm showing the slide, they could be understood all as marine megafauna. But we are talking essentially about seabirds, cetaceans, uh, marine mammals, uh, and the sea turtles, and fish, big fish. Some research considers well marine megafauna, all animals, they are heavier than 45 kilograms. But it's just an arbitrary definition that excludes like seabirds from the definition. So there's no actually consensus on, on this definition. But here we are considering those animals in blue. So trait-based biology, uh, as you see, is something that actually in the last 50 years was actually quite common. And now we're starting to be common again. Uh, since 2000, the number of publications, as you see in the x-axis, is a kind of increasing until 2000 in a exponentially uh, shape. So this area of research is really uh, uh, getting actual again, is resurfacing. Yeah. But if you look at vertebrates in blue in this graph, where you see the kinds of aspects, the kinds of traits they are being studied in the different studies, you see that, for example, in blue, when invertebrates regarding size, they are 
okay, well studied in comparison to vegetation and invertebrates. But when you looked at as important traits, especially of seabirds and marine mammals, like the special activity for migratory animals, they are really understood and understudied. Also feeding habits, they are incorporated to invertebrates, for example, understudied as well, or quite overlooked. You know, so compared to vegetables, life cycle is completely overlooked. So why? I have been asking myself, why are marine mammals, they are so well known, studied for centuries, why they are overlooked in trait-based approaches? Well, then really we need to look at function, uh, uh, taxonomic richness, pattern, richness patterns. If you look at vegetables, uh, plants, we have more than three, almost 400,000 species. Uh, phytoplankton, more than 10,000 species. Fish, more than 1,000 species, uh, actually uh, sharks. And seabirds, okay, around 400 species. So it's really complex to work with those groups, for example, plants. So trait-based approaches have been used actually to make it simple to, then to, to work with those groups because the taxonomical diversity is really not well established and really hard to work with. Then we go to marine mammals, less than 200 species and sea turtle seven species. So that's one of the reasons why there are a few studies based on trait, based, uh, based on traits of those animals. You, we can address the species yeah, individually, which is actually not so good and um, is also good for conservation of poop poses. But we, if you are trying to understand the functions of those animals in the planet, then it's not a good idea. Then we need to standardize to treat all those groups of animals and plants uh, in the same form. Then a number of studies have been popped up, changing the field of, again, uh, really important, Viol and MacGill that are influencing the field of research. Well, you can keep the slide, I can send that, share the slides afterwards. And yeah, that's the paper that we produced uh, actually in 2019, three years ago. And that's one of the main figures of the paper, of the paper, because it shows that body size and mass, it can be scaled over different groups of marine megafauna. Actually, body size can be scaled from bacteria to whales, to blue whales. So it's an excellent trait to study diversity. Man. And it's also a very good trait because it can be measured in a continuous scale and compared over different organisms to relate it to the functions. For example, the special performance and mortality rate. Uh, they are quite linked to ecosystem function that is nutrient transport and also ecosystem service like food provision and nutrient cycling. How? You probably know that uh, whales are migrating some, for example, pump pickle whales, they are migrating from nutrient rich waters to nutrient poor waters. And a large number of seabirds are also migrating for polar regions to tropical regions. And as the number of, of individuals are declining, the populations are declining, also the ecosystem function of nutrient transport from rich, nutrient rich polar regions to tropical waters is also declining. Yeah, this is just an example how we link uh, the functions to trades. And about the data set that we have been working with, we have, for example, uh, data on about 8,000 seabirds that we have been collecting on uh, 700 kilometers of beach in Brazil, 6,000 sea turtles and about 2,000 marine mammals. And there's a kind of a very good data because then we can collect body size and other, other morphological traits to study, for example, patterns of mortality. And with this data set, we have been doing studies like this. Here we are correlating, for example, the likelihood of sea birds ingesting debris, interacting with debris and uh, plastics in the water related to feeding behavior. And actually, if we are all expecting that the sea birds feeding on top of the ocean, the surface waters are very likely to ingest more often debris. And then we found actually that penguins, they are diving and exploring the whole column water, they are actually ingesting debris more often than those eating just in the 
ocean surface. That's a very good example how we can use traits to to make inference about existing functions and how those animals are getting vulnerable as well. And most of the ecology, like this study that we have been doing to try to analyze how seabirds respond, uh, die actually in response to environmental factors, we use model species. So we have albatrosses on the left, uh, the penguin, the Magellanic penguin, and the, the puffin in on the right. So we compare how those animals respond to wave high, for example, there's a tracker for storm intensity. But every, that's fine, that's also good. But one of the main questions here is actually which traits, which trait values make those animals vulnerable to storm intensity, for example. Then we could use, uh, analyze body size, which range of body size make these animals vulnerable, uh, which dispersal activity in kilometers, for example, make these animals vulnerable to storm activity. And another study that we have been doing, also linked to, to plastic, we have been doing a lot of research linked to plastic in the last years, is about the accumulation of plastic in nests of seabirds, uh, as you see here in the picture. Um, we compare basically traits of two species. As you see, trait biology in marine megafauna group is still quite limited. We are just comparing two species of birds with contrasting traits. One species is migratory on the left, is a tern. They build simple nests on the sand and they are quite light. They don't invest too much energy on, on reproduction like this. Uh, and the other species are, he is a big species, non-migratory. They build complex nests and they, they rate four kilos. So they invest a lot of energy. It's a trait of them investing a lot of energy in reproduction. So then we found that, for example, the cormorant, they are very likely to accumulate in the nests fishing gear because they are very similar actually fishing gear of uh, green color because they are very likely, they are very similar actually to the vegetables they use to build nests. So there's also another example how we use traits in all approaches. Maybe you working with mammals can make analogies and, and think of something similar. Yeah. And as I, as I said, uh, here's a study where we are grouping all the, the, the groups of marine mammals in the same category and dealing with traits. And then we started to look at, at mercury accumulation on those animals according to the traits. So we found, for example, that trophic position uh, body length and selenium, concentration of selenium and tissues, the uh, traits that are really important to predict the exposure of these animals to mercury. So it makes more sense than rather than just analyzing species by species, uh, it makes more sense to look at the whole group and of traits. And interesting, uh, there's a trait actually from marine megafauna that I think that's exclusive from vertebrates that it's not so well exploited in trait biology. There's charismatic potential. potential. Actually, charismatic potential, as you probably know as well, this is a trait that's linked to potential of attracting actually money to conservation units and different areas. So it's a trait that could be more exploited on this research area. And what makes interesting marine megafauna to study this aspect of trait-based approaches is that so much information has been, has been collected in the last centuries that we could use for this. And this is a picture, for example, of uh, more than three, uh, 300 years ago when the prince did know if it from Germany went to Brazil and was collecting information already. The Darwin and all those naturalists. I think this is very specific for marine megafauna. We don't have this kind of huge data for all the groups, I think. As another example, see about tracking databases, we have huge data sets, almost thousand data sets that have been uploaded. This was three years ago, so now we have even more data sets. And more than 12 million points, actually, that we have of, of point, location points that we have been tracking for those animals. So it's an impressive amount of data that would allow us to work with trade 
trait of those animals, no? like dispersion, perf dispersion performance and so on. And I think it's 15 minutes and I'm done. So I'm really, I would be happy with questions. <laughs> Now I I could unmute my phone. Thank you very much, Davy, for your extraordinary presentation. It will undoubtedly give us some role models and trait-based approach. As this is not just about cetaceans, but exploring also other marine megafauna strategy, as uh, Marcello uh, pointed out earlier. It is the impact into the entire ecosystems contributed by several species, even if we are focusing on cetaceans in this, in, in this workshop, certainly have relations with other. I will now open the floor for questions and comments on the work that Davy, Davy presented. And remember to introduce yourself if it's the first time you take the floor. Don't be shy. Any questions or comment, Marcello? I'm, I'm really, really sorry, Barbara, for keep making questions, but <laughs> since nobody asked. Um, gracias, David. Thank you so much, David, for, for that presentation. I was, I was wondering if we, when, when we do ecosystem services valuation, um, sometimes uh, we don't have data at, at, at our current site so we do what we call a benefit transfer. And that what, it's, uh, what it is, is that we take values from other studies and apply it to, to our study. Like in the, in the case of mangroves or coral reef, if they have already valued, I don't know, tourism in Philippines, then we can use it, that value in, in Costa Rica. But one key gap, research gap that it is, is the, the health of the ecosystem which is different between sites. Um, and this is for a very specific uh, valuation method that I'm talking about. But my, my point was, if we could use somehow these traits to assess the health of the ecosystem or the species that we want to value, and then use this as a coefficient to adjust that, that value. For example, if, if we uh, value the, the carbon sequestration provided by a humpback whale in, in, in Chile, and then we want to value the same thing here in, in Costa Rica, that is gonna change depending on the health of, of the species and the ecosystem, of course, and, and, and uh, we could use the value from the Chilean study perhaps, but we could adjust it through this kind of traits to make that adjustment of, of health. I don't know if, if that's too confusing, but I'm just wondering how, how much we could use this for, for assessing the health and then you know applying this to our evaluation methods. Yep. Thank you for your question, Marcelo. Uh, if I got your point right, first we need to define like health. What's a health ecosystem? And in this area of research that has been seen, is related to diversity. A health ecosystem is a ecosystem that's supporting diversity. If you look at this point, yes, using trade, a trade-based approach is really possible and good. Uh, and then we have several metrics for multiple, for compute, computing local and regional trade diversity and so on, based on hair traits and also abundant traits. And we have different indexes. What is really important for this is that all traits, they keep being measured in a continu continuous sc uh, scale. It makes every trait comparable. But if we keep like measuring traits, I don't know, in a categorical way, so the traits are not comparable. That's the big, biggest prob problem that we have been facing actually, because people work in phytoplankton when they use uh, categorical traits, it means completely another thing of Categorical traits that have been measuring sea about ecology, for example, uh, for diet, for example, is a very good example. Diet based on, I, I don't know, in cells or phytoplankton, 
itself. So what it means, I mean, abundant, low abundant, middle abundant, I mean, yeah, to keep measuring everything numerically is, is the way for, for keeping working with indexes and so on. Thank you. Is, is that your point or? Yes, yes, I think that that helps my 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 question. Although you know, I I still wondering how how to balance uh, some of these functioning and 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 services on on these specific uh, you know research methods using uh, health health proxies. And uh, I thought that 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 the framework that you presented, we yeah. we could use it. Um, we're gonna publish a a paper that defines you know ecosystem health depending on what we call vigor. Uh, organization and resilience. So the, the combination of those three uh, makes yeah, maybe, a healthy ecosystem. Maybe some index incorporates, it should be not so easy. Diversity is a very important component and then exposure to, to chemicals, to harmful chemicals as well. And then functions like, like you said, nitrogen transport and uh, storage actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, David. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Marcello, for the interesting question. Robert Johnson, please. Yeah, just a, a quick uh, a quick comment uh, bouncing off what uh, Marcello just said. There's actually a fair amount, actually there's a lot of work on, on uh, all the topics you just mentioned, um, which I'd be happy to point you to, both related to a range of different benefit transfer methods that you can use to do exactly the kind of adjustments that you're talking about, um, depending on what kind of underlying primary study data there are. I mean, obviously, you probably know all this, but you know, but whether you know whether you would use something like a, a benefit function transfer from a similar site or uh, something drawn from meta analysis, what have you. But there's work on that. Um, there's also um, some work on. The use of various types of multimetric indicators to measure um, to measure ecosystem health to the oh, and condition to the extent that that is valued by people, for example, related to non-use value. So that there's a bunch of stuff out there um, in in various places um, that, um, that that might be relevant um, depending on the on the specific application. But uh, as you know, I mean, there's there's quite a large benefit transfer literature on on how to do this sort of stuff, and also then how to link it to the type of ecological indicators. And there's also a literature on, on, on the use of these sorts of formal ecological indicators within valuation and, and, all sorts, and all sorts of things like that. So not really much time to discuss it in this workshop, but, but again, um, for the future, there's, there's a lot of, of material out there. Not so much on, on, on citations, but, but lots of direct parallels. Thank you very much, Robert, for pointing that out. And uh, I would like to give the floor if there is any more questions. It seems uh, no. So thank you very much for the questions and Davi for the clarifications. I will now introduce you to Mr. Marco Javorsek. He worked at the United Nations Statistics Division and will give a presentation on the United Nations System of Environmental Economic Accounting. Mr. Javorsek, thank you for joining us and contributing to this workshop. Hi, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Um, let me share my screen, my presentation. All right. Uh, can, I hope you can see this. Yes. Thank Perfect. you. Uh, thank you. Um, all right. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the chance to, to talk to you today. Um, as you said, I'm Marco Javorsek uh, from um, the um, United Nations Statistics Division. Um, I do have to apologize a little bit. This presentation was a little bit rushed and I was just uh, pulled into this yesterday. So, um, and I'm, I'm very sorry not to be able to participate in the rest of the meeting as I, uh, there was no time and um, to get a little bit more of an information 
about what is um, your initiative uh, and the participants uh, more interested. So I hope this will be interesting um, and I hope this will be useful. And so, as I said, I'm from the United Nations Statistics Division. We are here really responsible for um, coordination of, let's say, the global activities on um, statist uh, statistical capacity development and methodology development. Uh, we're really concerned with uh, developing um, global methodological guidelines on various areas. Obviously, in my particular area, it's the environmental economic um, accounting. Um, and I will be talking here about the um, the system of environmental economic accounting a little bit in general, and then move towards a little bit on the ecosystem accounting more in specific. Um, and hopefully there'll be time for some questions. Um, so uh, yeah, there is um, uh, we well more and more increasingly know that our economic well-being depends on the nature, and uh, that we are more and more interrelated uh, to nature to, um, in relation to biodiversity loss and climate change, which are some of the biggest factors um, that we are facing at the moment. But then uh, recently, we are obviously. Uh, there's a lot of debate on these um, headline indicators that we currently measure, like the GDP, are not really um, are not really uh, measuring these aspects and the depletion of the nature and the impacts of economic production on um, on nature and ecosystems. Um, so the whole sort of beyond GDP discussion has been very uh, prominent and very um, important and uh, decision makers have um uh so so that the decision makers have can have access to key information nece necessary to pursue and track sustainable development and here the um system of environmental economic accounting the sia uh really tries to fill the gap and really tries to bring this perspective to the table of how to um and and enrich this discussion uh, from a statistical perspective, obviously, uh, and and bring information to the policymakers on the impacts on the nature and the ecosystems. Um, the CS support, supports uh, really multiple ongoing initiatives. Uh, here I'm focusing on uh, the global initiatives such as Sustainable Development Goals, um, the current uh, post-2020 um, um, Biodiversity framework of the Convention of Biological Diversity, etc., um, that are being supported by the by the CIA. Uh, but there's there's many other measurement frameworks that the CIA could support, or the support is uh, including the um, climate change and uh, ocean economy, circular economy, etc. Um, so the CIA is really sort of a uh, the holistic framework for um, understanding the um, the nexus between the um, environment and the economy. Um, the CIA uses a um, accounting approach to integrate many data sets. Um, so one important thing here to mention is that it's really consistent with the system of national accounts. Um, System of national accounts being the standards that uh, produces what we know the GDP. Um, as he is fully um, aligned with that and uses the same um, uh, accounting uh, methodology. Um, it, it, um, it relies on multiple data sources uh, covering various different um, areas that are, that are spanning the environment economy nexus. Um, and these data sources are then combined uh, to produce integrated set of accounts uh, that are uh, useful for integrated uh, policy measurement analysis and design. Um, that is important because uh, an accounting framework gives more a robustness and uh, integration with the other uh, statistical data compared to um, compared to single indicators or, or a single piece of statistics. There are two perspectives of the SIA. Um, we have what we call the central frameworks perspective on the, on the left-hand side, which really measures the um, environmental assets in the 
assets as individual resources. So you, you look at the individual resources that are input into the economy, such as timber, water, fish, soil, etc. <clears throat> Uh, and on the other side, there is the ecosystem perspective, uh, where um, um, where we measure the um, the uh, the contribution of ecosystems and ecosystem services uh, to the economic um, and human well-being. Um, here, the look is rather on um, on these ecosystems such as forests, rivers, coastal reefs. West, wetlands, etc. So these are the two different perspectives that together that um, provide a um, provide a uh, an overview, provide holistic information on the um, environment ecosystem uh, nexus. As I mentioned, CI is already a, I mean, as already mentioned, CI is a, a statistical standard. Um, here I depict the um, on the left hand side, the um, system of national accounts, which has long um, been accepted as the international statistical standards um, in national accounts frame, framework or perspective. Uh, CI is, since 2012 has also been a international statistical standard um, or, uh, in the uh, central framework part. And there is this new um, perspective on ecosystem that has been added to the family since last year um expanding expanding the uh the overview on a more uh complete picture there's a there's several sets of uh underlying standards as well um related to water energy etc um that are giving a little bit more of detail in those particular areas i think um worth mentioning for you would be um there's also an idea of um Ocean accounting. Uh, there is also um, on sea ocean, sea ocean accounts um, to support um, the uh, understanding of of the oceans as, as different uh, areas, and also um, integrating this um, notion of uh, ocean economy into it. Uh, the, environment, uh, the environment economic nexus is really the nexus between the economy and the environment. So how we look at this in the CI is, uh, well, in the economy, we, produce, we very well know what we produce, what are the activities, etc. But then the CI brings this perspective of natural inputs coming into the economy. There's the uh, residuals, the emissions and the waste that are coming out of the economy, impacting the environment. And the environment also provides uh, uh, through the ecosystems, um, the ecosystem services um, that are many times already accounted for in the economic production, such as uh, you know, the uh, crop provision and timber, but many times are not um, not considered yet and can be many times seen as free uh, would be the air pollution or the um, carbon sequestration services that are very important for um, human wealth. So this is really the uh, nexus that the CIA provides. Um, and um, then a little bit more on the ecosystem accounting. Um, as I said, the um, uh, in 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 the CIA central framework, it looks a little bit more of a, on the, um, on assets as individual assets, individual environmental assets, the timber, the fish. Whereas here we look more on the ecosystem services. And this is the new standard that was developed um, and adopted just last year. I particularly worked on the um, development of this standard and uh, the revision of it over the last four years period. Um, so here, um, the perspective is really the environment, the ecosystem assets um, are the forests, the rivers, the, the, uh, the coastal areas, um, the wetlands. Um, they have certain characteristics, they have an extent, they have a condition. Um, and these ecosystem assets then provide ecosystem services to, um, to the economy, to the society um and they they provide benefits for us 
So these ecosystem services are at the center of um, the system. We um, aim to measure the ecosystem services. Uh, there, are, there can be either um, uh, pro uh, provisioning ecosystem services, such as um, crop provisioning, uh, uh, timber provisioning, fish, etc. Uh, they can be uh, regulating ecosystem services. And these are usually not considered in what we call the production boundary or from the national account. So far, these are, let's say, um, the air uh, filtration, carbon sequestration, um, the soil um, um, uh, erosion or um, prevention of erosion, um, the uh, water purification, etc. services that are very important and we take for granted so far. Um, but by implementing uh, the SIA, we can start measuring them and start understanding their uh, contribution to the actual production. Uh, and they can also be the third area of the, uh, of the ecosystem services are cultural services. So these are um, the recreation services, for example, that a particular uh, ecosystem can provide to hum human uh, well-being. Um, that, for example, the the forests or the the parks are close to um, close to uh, people where the, where people live. Um, ecosystem accounts are composed of five uh, crucial accounts. So there is the ecosystem and uh, extent and ecosystem condition stock accounts that are sort of the basis, and uh, that uh, then provide the basis to um, uh, to compile ecosystem services flow accounts. Um, the, the basic uh, perspective of the SIA is that it provides perspective on the, um, in, in physical terms, in physical units, uh, but then they can be also monetized to provide perspective on uh, in monetary units, in dollars or whatever be um, to link to the, um, the national accounts and other systems. Um, a very quick illustrative example, uh, so we have an asset, for example, a, co um, a forest, we measure its um, condition, the soil depth, uh, the tree cover, etc. And, and then we, uh, we can derive the provision of the, of the service, so in this case it's water filtration, uh, and measuring physical units, uh, and this uh, provides then the benefit of the clean water to the people that are down the stream from this forest. Um, so as I, as I said, this uh, ecosystem accounting has been developed uh, and adopted by the UN Statistical Commission last year. So it's a new standard. We are moving towards its implementation and use on a global level. Um, there are several activities that are, the, that are um, happening at the moment from capacity building, um, the development of guidelines, uh, communication advocacy, strengthening collaboration with different partners. Um, uh, so, 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 so it's really the uh, it's really an important um, topic at the moment for us, and at the global level also with the development of several international um, stand measurement standards, namely on the um, climate change and biodiversity fronts. Um, the SIA around the world is, uh, we have approximately 90 countries that have already implemented and already developing some accounts. These are mostly uh, central framework type of accounts. The uh, ecosystem services are still lagging a little bit behind. And also worth to note, uh, there are many countries in Africa that are uh, fortunately still um, not implementing the SIA. So we're really trying to uh, aim towards uh, improving this map here uh, together with our partners. Um, just wanted to quickly link to um, ocean accounting, um, since I guess that would be something that you're interested in. Um, and the US Statistical Commission has also proposed development of a, a specific standard called SIA Ocean um, that would, uh, you know, standardize the, the sea ocean accounting. Um, there's been some initial work already done by UNESCO, the Regional Commission for Asia Pacific and, and the Global Partnership for 
um, uh, the, the global uh, budget for ocean accounting um, on some technical guidance. But at the moment, we are really missing some um, some more financing um, to to take this for, forward. We have developed um, a working group on oceans that um, that will hopefully lead this forward and provide some strategic and technical direction towards development of a sea ocean. We're starting to work on three areas. Uh, there will be one is on oceans and the policy. Um, trying to see, um, trying to have an initial focus on reporting and indicators, how to support the indicator framework. Um, looking at data, so what would be the core data and the core accounts and what are the pilot projects that have been done in ocean accounting so far? There's been quite a bit done in Asia and the Pacific region. And looking also at ocean economy, um, how to define, there's some uh, measurement um, issues uh, and measuring the boundary issues that need to be um, clarified uh, for what constitutes uh, ocean economy. Uh, and at the end, uh, I will just run through a um, couple of examples. Um, um, so in the ecosystem extent account, here's an example from the EU countries. Uh, you know, this information can be at the compilation of the accounts and the ecosystem extent in Europe can be presented in a tabular format, but it can also be neatly presented in a, in a graphic, in a map. Uh, that's the big advantage. Um, the spatial contribution of the ecosystem accounts is very important. Um, on a condition account, um, there is a measurement of, uh, for example, there's an example of um, several indicators that have been developed in EU uh, for measurement of um, uh, of rivers and lakes. Uh, there's several uh, uh, there's several indicators that have been measured in the period between 2010 and 2020 to measure and understand the con the, the condition of rivers and lakes in the EU. My last example, um, I, know, I understand I'm running through this very, very quickly, but maybe uh, this will be made available. This presentation will be made available so you can um, have a quick, have a look more uh, into more details. This is a measurement of ecosystem services that was done for, for a KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. 11 services have been measured for these, what they call biomes and uh, their contribution their uh, the provision of these services in a leader natural uh, physical or or uh, monetary units has been valued um, for uh, for this province and then um, for example here in this map one of the um, solar erosion has also been mapped into a uh, spatial perspective uh, by using this methodology um, so that's it. I hope this was useful and I hope um, um, it was not overrunning too much. No, I think I'm pretty much on time. Thank you very much for time and chance to talk to you today. Thank you very much, Marco, for your presentation. It's very interesting to know the advances this year is doing. And I will now open the floor for questions and comments to your presentation. And please, if you haven't uh, addressed before, remember to introduce yourself before uh, when you take the floor. Questions? Natalie Hoodman? Yes, Hi, please. Every Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, my name is Natalie Houtman. I work for uh, WWF in the Netherlands. Uh, thank you very much, Marco, for uh, your presentation. Uh, I wasn't aware uh, that all of this was happening um, and uh, very valuable, I think, also to this uh, uh, workshop. Um, I was wondering, because you were telling about uh, that you are measuring um, uh, on an asset level and uh, more an ecosystem service level. 
Um, to what degree are the assets incorporated into the ecosystem uh, service? Because um, there is, of course, also an interaction between those. Could you elaborate on that, please? Thanks. Chair, should I go or? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for the question. Um, Yes, uh, so these are two measurement perspectives that the CR foresees. It's really looking at, uh, at the uh, environmental, economic and nexus from two different perspectives. Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, the assets are embedded within the ecosystems, because if you look at a forest, uh, it is composed of trees, uh, right? And these trees are uh, at least potentially timber that can be harvested um for uh for production um but the perspective of measurement is very different um, if you think of um on one hand you can think of only the for the, the timber being an asset that is harvested or potentially harvested so there's there's a stock and there's harvested so that timber is directly used and enters the economy for production of tables and etc so that's one view uh, but the other view is the ecosystem is not only the trees, is much more than the trees. It provides services um, to the uh, to the uh, to the humanity to to us and also beyond. Um, so um, it, you know, as I mentioned, the 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 the, the forest can provide water purification, air filtration, carbon sequestration. Um, habitat, uh, recreation services, mm -hmm. etc. So that's why this perspective on the ecosystem is much more broader and much more um, much more beyond looking at uh, individual assets. Uh, and in these individual assets, the timber provision itself, it is one of the service. So it's sort of included in there. For statistical purposes, it's 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 separated at the moment, but there is a plan. It's at a later stage, actually, obviously, to unite this uh, and to take this on a uh, on a more united level. Yeah, I hope they asked your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much, um, Barbara. Could I maybe also ask a follow up question? Yes. <laughs> Um, thank you. So to what degree then is biodiversity, for example, reflected in the ecosystem service uh, perspective? Um, yes, biodiversity is, um, is an aspect of... Uh, it, biodiversity can be argued is much broader than the ecosystem, right? Um, by one of, one of the... Uh, one of the perspectives of uh, of biodiversity. I'm not an expert on biodiversity as such, so uh, and so I don't want to um, make a false claim. But one of the aspects of biodiversity is the the bi the di diversity of species. The other aspect is diversity of ecosystems. So the diversity of ecosystem as such is an aspect of biodiversity. Um, and um, so, so, so in that argument, the biodiversity is much broader than uh, than ecosystems themselves. Uh, having said that, uh, many um, aspects of biodiversity enter the ecosystem accounting as perspectives of the condition um, of of those assets of those uh, ecosystems. Um, so, uh, so for example, taking an example of uh, species diversity uh, would be a condition um, indicator of a forest ecosystem. Um, equally so, um, fish uh, abundance uh, would be an e e condition indicator of a uh, ocean um, ecosystem. Um, as well as in the in the perspective of um, ecosystem extent and um, the 
variation and the diversity of ecosystems plays a role in them in there so so the more the ecosystems and the the bigger they are uh they will that will be reflected reflected also through their extent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And looking forward to uh, try and translate this to the, the whale workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie, and for your question and Marco for replying. Uh, I will offer the floor for other questions. Yes, Marcello, please. Thank you, Barbara. And, and thank you, Marco. This is gonna be a really uh, quick question is um, how can we account for transboundary assets, uh, which is gonna be related to, you know, the ownership of the resource. And in this workshop, of course, is key, right? So uh, in the case of whales, um, how, how do we account for, for those benefits if, or should we account for the benefits in different countries in each one of the system of, 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 of national accounts? Um, or perhaps should we have a new system of accounting for global commons as the ones that exist in the high seas and, and migratory species? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hello for the question. Um, yes, that's not not a simple question actually. <laughs> um, yes, uh, so the uh, so as I, as I said, SIA follows the principles of uh, national accounting. So so this so the perspective is limited to um, to the country perspective as such. The good the 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 perspective or the um, nature of the SIA is that it's very scalable. It doesn't have to be a country. It can be a subnational area as well. It can be a province, as I mentioned, mentioned the example of one of the provinces in South Africa. Uh, it can also be. It could be transboundary provinces, or it could be or it could be regional on a on a more uh, beyond one country regional uh, perspective. Um, so, so that so the so the scalability is there. Um, uh the however the transboundary issue remains regardless right there will be always a flow of of um, assets and uh, services between these um, areas so so they they are in in the statistical sense they are handled in a similar way as um, in national accounts they are handled as um exports and imports of uh, of of assets and services um However, what you are really going to, I think, is uh, is this perspective or this particular perspective of the oceans, um, particular characteristic of the oceans, where you have um, we have large areas that are beyond national jurisdiction, uh, they are beyond the economic um, exclusive economic zone, which is usually the the boundary for um, for statistics. Um, and that is something that is still being dealt with um, and is something that we are really interested in to bringing into the discussion because that brings a different perspective on the environment, on the oceans. And that is something also that is very important for the ocean accounting. As I mentioned, we want to develop a ocean accounting perspective, ocean accounting standard uh, that could that will need to deal with these boundary issues and how to deal um with the ownership or well, the lack of ownership of the uh assets there are um, in the high seas right that's right thank you thank you marco thank you thank you marcello and marco for the discussions uh, i will Offer the floor for more questions. It seems none. So it's a very interesting presentation that give us some uh, more uh, ingredients to think. Has it's I think quite different from what we have been looking at the whales valuation more directly has uh, 
uh, Natalie expressed, than uh, the ecosystem. It's the whale itself that is providing the service, and then we have stopped there. So this make it even bigger, and may perhaps the IWC will be a, a proper forum to advance on the ocean sea or contribute to the ocean sea as there is, of course, migratory, migratory species and transboundary issues there too. So thank you very much, all of you for the interesting question and comment. And thank you, Marco, for joining us and all the presentation. It seems you will not be able to join us during the rest of the thank workshop. Yeah, unfortunately, no. <laughs> but uh, but I wish you all the luck with the with the workshop. I hope uh, I hope we can connect with the um, IWC colleagues uh, later on to uh, for some feedback for some um, uh, so if there's any extra queries or 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 clarifications. Be happy to follow up later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, I think that they, we are already starting a collaboration uh, with you, and uh, certainly uh, we might be uh, forwarding the workshop report to the SIA as it may contribute to the SIA ocean accounting. So thank you very much for your participation and enlightening us with this new account accounting method and systems. We will now move to the last blocks of today's sessions i would like to ask the rapporteur Barbara, to sorry to interrupt but charlotte yes. has her charlotte has her hand up ah sorry i didn't see charlotte please you are uh, mute Sorry, my, my question is coming like, thank you very much, Barbara. And uh, thank you, Marco. So I am uh, Charlotte Nita from uh, uh, an NGO called Robert Desbois, which is observer at the IWC for about uh, 30 years. Uh, and uh, um, my question is uh, quite uh, practical. Do you have uh, examples of uh, practical application of this uh, system of uh, accounting? Uh, I, I, for example, during uh, uh, trials, trials to, um, um, to determine uh, damages uh, after a pollution or uh, to modify a project uh, or to uh, stop uh, a new project? I mean, um, you, you gave us uh, uh, several examples of area uh, with uh, studies, uh, but um, sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to see the practical uh, consequences of all this uh, huge work. I mean, uh, of course, I understand the, 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 the usefulness, of course, of this work, but uh, on the, 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 the field, um, do you have uh, right now some uh, example for, for us? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. Um, yes, I mean, and this to start, just to make it very clear, this is really intended to be a uh, national level accounting. So it's, it's really intended for countries to develop their official statistics. Um, so the mo most of the examples are um, statistical examples from uh, official statistics. Uh, we do have, so I would suggest you go to our website, which is uh, www.caseea.un.org. Um, um, it's also, um, and, um, and there we also have a knowledge base where you can find several of reports, several examples of application of accounts in different countries around the world. As I mentioned, there's about 90 countries that have developed accounts. Um, it, is, it is also important to know that this is a system of a statistical uh, st statistics development. So, so it really is not intended to be a, an assessment for a project. It's not intended to be an assessment for a certain investment. Uh, it can certainly support that, but it's it's more of a intended to be a system that will help the country develop statistics on a sustainable level that will be comparable going forward 
uh, with um, uh, going going forward in time. Having said that, there's there were several initiatives, um, and we will be working with also the Capitals Coalition, um, who um, who have also applied the SIA in the in business accounting, and they've used SIA for. Uh, for uh, for um, evaluation of um, sustainability of businesses, um, and I believe there is a couple of examples on that on our website as well. Uh, so would uh, would want to um, we, we would invite you to check that, um, and would invite you to if but you're more than welcome to write to me directly if you have any more specific questions as well, uh, and I can direct you to some more uh, direct uh, examples. that answers thank you thank you charlotte and thank you marco is if there any ones that want to take the floor marco just write down the website in the chat so you can find the information there so thank you very much, Marco, for your presentation and joining us. And uh, hope you have a good end of day, I think, where you are now. We are now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, now we will continue to the last block of today's sessions. We have already seen a little bit undiscussed earlier, the table one of the scientific committee. And I would like to ask the rapporteurs to share the table on threats and contribution identified at the scientific workshop. The objective of this work will be to review each of these contribution and identify if these have been or have not been yet considered from a socioeconomic perspective and what it would be that service provides. Therefore, we can realize the extent of such service provided. Not that in these sessions, we are looking at the contribution of cetaceans to ecosystem function. Therefore, other services, for example, such as whale watching, are, which is a recreational service, are not included but we understand that socioeconomic valuation may also be interested in analyze, analyzing these other aspects. Uh, but as uh, the IWC resolution pointed out, it was interested in the ecosystem functioning part. And the scientific committee also focused on the nutrient circulation, ocean fertilization, whale falls, and cetacean has predated. But there might be, of course, other socioeconomic dimension of contribution to ecosystem functioning, perhaps even not previously identified at the scientific committee level, but that during this workshop, we may consider important as well and feel free to uh, raise the, the flag for any contribution that could have some socioeconomic value. Mm -hmm. So, before starting to read, just to get an idea of the enormous amount of threats identified by the scientific committee that provides service, which now I'm not sure how we will manage all this information, as Robert pointed out and Marcello, they have additional levels in between that we need to transform these threats into like, like a cetacean accounting and then into an ecosystem accounting. So it's a, after this first day session, I think what we were expecting to get it narrower is getting <laughs> with more, more aspects to be included. So what was suggested uh, by DJ, to me earlier was to first, before moving forward, agree the column that we will be analyzing just to get a sense on 
what uh, Robert Johnson and Marcello were suggesting earlier. Can you please, I think my, I can't see really good then the, the, the table. So I will open the discussion now to see the columns if you think it valuable to review all these lines and see if there is a socioeconomic contribution, for example, of the whale feces we know, but perhaps of the peeling of the waves and the ski, sloth skin not necessarily. Is the value direct, indirect, or both? What are the examples? What are the beneficiary of this service? and type of capital that interacts with the services. And if this has been considered previously from a social economical perspective or not. At least until, the, until this, this table is in the share point of the workshop. And I will request all of you that have time and the knowledge to go through this table and try to put your uh, things, your thoughts about each of the 30, 31 threats identified by the scientific committee. So we can go to work on the third day with this table at the end and see if we can get, get this as a starting point. Also, Toshi realized this might be very important for the scientific committee to receive our inputs. Perhaps there are some uh, services uh, that are more relevant from a social economical perspective than other. And then the scientific committee could focus his work also in uh, getting more information to cover the research gaps that are really enormous amount of knowledge gap on this newly emerging topic. So I offer the floor for people if, you agree with these columns? If you th think they are sound? Uh, Marcello? Yeah, no, what I was gonna tell is that, uh, you know, in how this works is, I mean, in general way, uh, is that if there's someone that gets a benefit from that function, then the service exists. If no one benefits, then the service doesn't exist. And from the economic valuation point of view, have a value of zero, right? So uh, I don't know if having uh, that column of who are the beneficiaries put it after the service or uh, could be helpful to be more straightforward to identify which services are, are really relevant. And uh, we also have to be careful of not confusing functions and services, right? Because um, under like D D six transport of nutrients from highly productive foraging, that sounds like a function, uh, not a service per se. And so we we need to translate that to a to a service. Uh, you know, but they used to call those supporting services, but at, at the end, they are more functions. And I don't know if, if everybody agree with me with this, but those are the, the, the key small details that, that we need to be careful. Like they say, you know, the devil is in the details. Thank you, Marcelo, for pointing that out. Yes, uh, I think if you can move the day to the first columns, uh, the table one of the scientific committee included the threads, then in the description, so we understand what they are uh, referring to the thread, the functions it covers, and then the services. I haven't reviewed, I, I was at the workshop, but I haven't reviewed in detail the the table to know if uh, it's 
the service or a function, it's placed in the good columns, but they did work on that uh, direction. Do you have uh, your hands raised, Marcello, or it is? Okay. Sorry, I just lowered it. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert, please. Yeah, so to a certain extent, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit out of school because I'm I'm far from an expert on you know this type of uh, marine system functioning, but it strikes me just looking at the at the first couple rows here um, where we've got different traits that, that you know that have different effects on these systems. A lot of them are kind of are broadly similar in that you've got different dimensions of cetaceans that are that are essentially kind of affecting broader ecosystem function in different areas right you're moving nutrients up and down you're moving nutrients side to side right from from some areas to other areas you're supporting micro microbial connectivity right all of these are part of kind of the general right eco ecological machinery that's affecting different ecosystems in different areas right and, and the specific mechanisms of those effects are different right are you moving things up or down side to side right ever are what what sorts of, of organisms are you affecting but basically what we're influencing is how different areas of of of, of these marine ecosystems are functioning and so it strikes me that that this is it's hard to talk about without thinking about this in a fundamentally spatial way right because if you think about how marine ecosystems the the influence on people right if i'm thinking about socioeconomic impacts well people aren't everywhere right and so if you're talking about effects you know in in the far southern oceans where there aren't many people well those are Im impacts are going to look very different than if you're talking about something in say cape cod bay right where you've got you know where you've got a, a whole lot of people um now so in, in general right one could think about kind of broader sorts of things okay well they're going to affect fisheries right so that's an obvious one that you could you could you could pick on that's going to be recreational and commercial right they might affect other sorts of recreational uses of these systems and again to a certain extent i'm guessing because i'm not an ecologist i don't know how these how these systems propagate or how these effects propagate through systems so okay so so fisheries uh tourism and recreation sorts of activities right those are an obvious one um you know, carbon sequestration is an obvious one, but that's further down, right? And, and, then you, and then you kind of look further. I mean, in all cases, you could at least, a nice thing about non-use values is in concept, people can have non-use values for anything, although they tend to be larger for certain things than for others, but at least in concept, people can have, people can have non-use values for improved deck ecosystem function we know that right and so so you can start to think about these kind of initially broadly what are the big big picture top things that tend to be affected and i'm sure i'm missing some but then other things are you know to to answer the question are these likely to be relevant important whatever then i think you need to to get a little more spatial because it really depends on where the people are right you can have a major effect on all sorts of fish but if nobody's there to catch them the fishery the direct commercial fisheries impact might be minimal unless there's some broader impact right those fish migrate someplace else blah 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 right and so 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 the so the the importance question then really is is a spatial question unless you want to say well is this impact potentially important somewhere right and then it's then it's not spatial anyway i'm not sure if that's useful or not but. thank you robert for your comment indeed one of the uh, questions at the scientific committee workshop was also uh, related to spatial dimensions has the whales, for example, might be contributing more into the Southern Ocean to a global strategy uh, for mitigating climate change than in a lower latitudes. And this, is, uh, all, this has also been from a scientific perspective raised if this effect is more important in the North Pacific or in the 
in the Southern Ocean or those type of things for the whales, for the nutrient they contributing to one or other, not, not related to the people, which is something, as you mentioned, or Marcello mentioned, it's a different uh, approach here because it's uh, the ultimate benefits also for that it's being looked for, not just the direct effect of, of the pieces of, of the waveforms. Yes, do you have uh, something else to add? Or the, the hand was up? Okay, thank you. So, is there are any other comment? I will just uh, have you to look at each of these lines to get a brainstorm and get all this input from the scientific committee that they really identified almost each threat. And so we can uh, have in mind during these next sessions days, how extent this can, can be and what has been or not uh, considered from a socioeconomic perspective. Marcello, please. Yeah, Barbara, well, um, yeah, building on what Robert was saying is actually also uh, one thing that I said that, yeah, who are the beneficiaries and where are they, right? Because that, that it's what defines the, the service. Some services are global and some services are more local. And what is really interesting here is that if, for example, a humpback whale provides one service in the tropics, it could be providing another service in Antarctica, right? So that, that could be very interesting here. But I don't know if it would be also useful to, because I'm really not convinced that all of the, the rows here are uh, correctly categorized as, serv as services. For example, I was going through that table and D19 says ecosystem resilience and stability. That, that's not a, an ecosystem service or vertical transport of nutrient. All, all, of these, all of these nutrients ones, I wouldn't it consider the majority of uh, services, uh, these, these are functions, uh, but I don't know if these are set on stone and not open to discussion, uh, because I think we, we have here a, an issue of what really is a service and what is a function. And I, I think we're, we might be confusing this. But I mean, that's that's my very humble opinion. I don't. I could be totally wrong about this. Thank you, Marcello, Robert. Yeah, just to um, just to uh, react to that, I think that's right. Um, and but so so despite the fact that I think that's right, th there's not necessarily anything wrong with starting with functions and then tracing them to services. So to a certain extent, as long as it's we clear as long as it's clarified somewhere in the table, right? I mean, so often when when uh, when I draw when we draw these kind of causal chains or means end diagram, you start with the ecosystem uh, functions or changes in ecosystems, and then you trace them through to the ecosystem services down the line because people often like to start with the functions, right? That's the things that 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 we can identify most easily. So um, so so maybe the solution, and I, I don't. Is, is not to change all the rows, but just to clarify that these are in fact functions as, as Mar or, or whatever you'd want to call them as, as Marcello, I think correctly um, stated, um, but then trace them through to say, okay, now we're going to trace them through to, to one or more ecosystem services that might be produced from those functions, right? The alternative would be to start with ecosystem services, but that might be a little harder because sometimes those services that you might get, for example, increased harvest of some fish that, you know, that, that you know, isn't a cetacean, right? That might be a little confusing to people because then the columns are, are kind of, the rows are things that don't really, that aren't directly related to, to cetaceans are indirectly related. So, so maybe the, the, the rows are maybe the, the, uh, the right rows. We just have to make sure we understand what they are. Thank you, Robert and Marcello for pointing that out. 
I think we can add an extra column and put our interpretation from services has this was done, this table was done at the scientific committee workshop and probably they are more related to the functions rather than the services. So we can have a double check and make it sure we are envisaging the same uh, services from the same trade. So, so Barbara, what would you like me to, to add? Uh, would you like me to add something to this, just indicating that we will revisit no, this list of in, services? I, I would add in a G column, and services review or something like that. So we can complement, this is not the service provided, the growth rate of phytoplankton, for example, but this is another, or if it's the same, we leave it like that. Do you think it's that's a sound way to proceed, Marcello? Yeah, well, you know, um, I think table uh, column C and D are functions. Uh, and so we could have another, a new a column of services on how, on how we're interpreting those functions. We, we might find that column D might have some services, but right now that I'm, the ones that I'm looking um, at. Sorry, I think I lost signal connection. Sorry, can you hear me? Hello. Is... Can, I can think I have me? a problem with my internet connection now. Hi, sorry, I get off with the internet. No, don't know what happened. Oh. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, no, yeah. that I was just saying that uh, we might find that there are some services in that column D, but uh, for now, the, yes. the majority that I see are functions, right? So C and D are functions, uh, and we could have another, a new yes. column G with, you know, services determined by the workshop participants or, or whatever. Yes, that was my, my suggestion. Uh, DJ? To get that, if, if we can add an extra between G and H column and put just services as we understand in this workshop. Perhaps oh, oh. between D and G. Yeah, that's I, I was going to yes. say between D and G. So I, I, yes. added, I added some text to indicate that we will review the content ah, of perfect. the cells in D. But uh, what we can do is... Uh, either add a new column for sort of services specific to the, uh, the interpretation of this workshop or uh, you I, know, the, uh, yes, the, rapporteurs, I, I just... the rapporteurs can work on moving whatever functions are in the services column to the function column and then insert yes. or, or with the, assess the assistance of the experts insert uh, what the actual services are according to our interpretation. The, uh, DJ, I wouldn't suggest that. I prefer rather to include a new column as this is the table from the scientific committee workshop as it is. And okay. we shouldn't edit it directly, but we can uh, have our comments on the services provided per each thread for this workshop. So this is, uh, we might be using the threads from the scientific committee uh, report, but we are now conducting our perspective and review from a socioeconomic uh, view, which is not the view that from scientific committee, they weren't thinking on any socioeconomic perspective when they, they did the, the, the workshop. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I, I added a new column. Is that acceptable for now? I, I'm, I think there is no no, no comments. Astrid has uh, raised her hand. Yeah, sorry, but actually you just preempted what I was going to say. So it was pretty much on the line what you just said. Um, and yeah, just, just to ensure that actually the services that we determine in this workshop are actual socioeconomic determined services. Uh, meaning, for example, and, and I think you've scrolled down on it now a little bit, but um, 
<clears throat> when we were uh, a little further up um, and it was about um, the, um, the whole um, uh, part about uh, impact on phytoplankton and so on. So the service would be, um, hang on, yeah, basically it, it, it was that the service uh, provided, yeah, 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 I think just the, the first one actually here, macronutrients and whale feces, so on the trade. Um, so the service actually would not just be the growth, but actually the provision of um, of uh, oxygen and uh, you know uh, on on those lines. So basically, the the top level of services provided, um, I, I think, should be included in, in some in some terms here as well. Um, of of course, uh, the the oxygen is not really socially economic, but it, it's just a, a basic um ecosystem service but i think that that's something we should include as well thank you astrid and marcello yeah well and i don't know if they would this would be useful but we don't have to you know invent the wheel regarding the names of the services because this has been like in the literature been for for many decades now for example that that example of 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 phytoplankton it translates into climate regulation, right? So uh, tomorrow, I think Dr. David Stottier and uh, Dr. Uh, is it Cook uh, David from Iceland, um, they're speaking and they produce a paper uh, where they categorize the different ecosystem services provided by whales. Um, so we, we already have the categories that we could put here as a, as a translation of the functions. Uh, yeah. And they're pretty straightforward. Hey, thank you very much for the suggestion, Marcello. So I would uh, ask participants if they are happy with this uh, table and table columns so we can proceed and start reviewing. Uh, DJ, yes. Um, I think Mar Mar Marcello mentioned earlier that uh, there might be value in in indicating where the beneficiaries are. And I'm wondering if we need a separate column for that or should I add it to column H? Perhaps we could do it in the, in the same column. Uh, I, I don't know, we, this, we could review this while we're working on it perhaps. Because I don't want to make the table too complicated, or with you know lots of lots of of, of columns. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, Robert also pointed these pointed these out, so perhaps he he has a better suggestion. Okay, thank you, uh, Marcello. If uh, Robert, it's okay to have it uh, also together, who and where? Um, so, so you're asking me, um, so adding a column about- um, about Where? About who and where. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I think that that would, um, would certainly um, help. I mean, um, yeah, I'm, this is the first time I've seen this table, so. Um, I mean, in general, I'm thinking about, um, I mean, so, so these types of exercises have been done um, lots of times before for, for other settings, and I'm trying to remember what was done. Um, and there's kind of two, two different approaches, right? One is just to say, um, you know, uh, is just to say, could these beneficiaries exist somewhere, right? So in this case, you maybe, you know, whatever recreational anglers is one of your are one of your beneficiary groups, and then you just say, okay, there's recreational anglers somewhere that benefit from this particular ecosystem service, and you really don't care where they are because they exist somewhere. On the other hand, 
you might want to get down to that resolution of do you care, right? So for example, we know that, that, that we suspect that recreational anglers are benefiting from these particular services in particular areas of the world, but not others, right? And if that's something you wanna know, then you, then you would definitely wanna add that column. So, so I guess it really depends on kind of what you wanna know and how you're gonna use this table, right? At, at, at what resolution is all that you care about. Do these exist somewhere? Possibly, in which case you don't need to know where as long as somebody can say, yeah, it happened somewhere. On the other hand, if you're going to use this to guide specific studies and specific, you know, whatever in, in, in areas, then you probably do. Um, so. Um, yeah. OK, but, Th thank you, Robert. Marcello. Sorry, no, because uh, other way would be just to categorize if, if the beneficiaries are local or global. Climate regulation, it's pretty obvious it's global. Um, so at the end, I don't know how, how much this is needed. And I totally agree with, with Robert. It depends on, on the objective that we want to reach. If, if we really want to determine which services are happening in which parts of the world in order you know, to expand the research needs and policy needs that we need to address, then that would be useful. But if not, perhaps it's not that useful and we could just focus on who are the beneficiaries independently or, or on where they are. Okay, thank you. DJ? Uh, a question of clarification for Robert and Marcelo or, or frankly anyone else. Um, but for those of us who aren't economists on this call, when we're when we're considering evaluating the ecosystem services provided by cetaceans, can the beneficiary be non-human? That is, can a value be um, can a value value be assessed, for example, to a marine predator, um, for, for a marine predator mm -hmm. that might consume a, a cetacean, either a live or dead cetacean. Can, can, can a marine predator be a beneficiary or are beneficiaries beneficiaries in the context of valuing ecosystem services always a human group? In, in, just to answer quickly, in the context of ecosystem services and economic values, beneficiaries are always people. Um, doesn't mean that, that, that one can have other philosophies of value in, in, which, um, in which values are, are more broadly conceptualized. But if we're talking about Economic, socioeconomics, ecosystem services, as for example, as an economist would think about it, um, the only, only, the only organisms that can receive values are human organisms. Um, you know, uh, with with all the baggage that that implies, right? So if it doesn't affect people in an ecosystem services value framework, it it doesn't have a value. That effect can be indirect, right? So for example, maybe a predator eats something. And then that predator is valued by people for some other purpose, right? Um, and in which case that's a value. But but the, but effectively there are no, I guess what we sometimes people call them intrinsic values, values of nature to nature itself, right? That yeah, value yeah. would exist if there were no people, and that that's not at least what what an economist would think of as a value. That's something else. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it's a total anthropogenic because at the end, what you want is to how to incorporate these values in policy making, right? Uh, specifically, for example, in cost benefit analysis. So we are the, the species that have the stewardship problems. We are the ones that don't know how to steward our planet. So we need to make these values visible in order to you know, make those uh, recommendations. And by the way, intrinsic values uh, are very important from a human perspective, for example, from a spiritual or, or you know, a cultural value. It's, it's just the value that you add to a well just because their existence, right? So it, it is also applies for, for humans. Although uh, just to clarify, I was, I was, uh, so I would characterize those as non-use values and, and agreed hundred percent. That's totally valid. When I, 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 I guess um, some people use intrinsic values for something else, right? And, and, and spiritual and cultural values come, are, are in kind of that gray area. I was thinking of intrinsic values where in some cases, um, uh, the, you know, you would, people would say, well, that you know, the nature has, has a value in and of itself, 
totally apart from people, right? So people could be entirely gone and nature would have a value as opposed to a value that a person might have due to say the cultural or spiritual significance. And, and maybe we're just getting too down the rabbit hole here, but um, anyway. Thank you very much, Robert and Marcello for the clarifications. So now we have to make sure that when we go through the workshop, we refer to this human anthropogenic socioeconomic value and the beneficiary is the humans. There is the extra column on uh, if the value direct, indirect or both in J. And I think that's it's pointing to the predators that may be an indirect value to, to, to humans. And uh, I would uh, suggest to add a where are the beneficiaries column, just in case we can come with some interesting, after doing the exercises, interesting areas that can overlap also the scientific committee work. So we know what might be to prioritize uh, for future research and uh, strategies. Uh, is there any uh, support to that uh, proposal? Or do you have any other comments? No? Okay, this Rebecca, please. Thanks, uh, Barbara. And just sorry, one last thing I'm, I'm thinking about today in terms of cultural values. The IWC does establish and oversee a uh, quota system uh, strike limit algorithms for for non-commercial uh, whaling, Aboriginal subsistence whaling. And I don't know if those cultural values are something that we want to be including in this table, but it's certainly uh, one of the mandates of the commission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Uh, I have uh, Marcello and Robert also that raised their uh, hands. Uh, Marcello, please. Well, um, Rebecca was, was first, sorry. Yes. Oh, she lowered her hand. Or well, should I go? Yes, Ma uh, Rebecca already. Uh, gave her intervention. Oh, Go ahead, oh, was, Matt. Yes, sorry. Um, no, I, I, I don't know if we should keep um, column K. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to make this table super complicated because here it could confuse people. Uh, what I think from the economic perspective is that the intention of, of that column was to sort of categorize the total economic value of, of the ecosystem. Oh. And here's where, where we say direct, indirect, non-use value, use value, et cetera, right? So uh, indirect values doesn't, from my perspective of valuing uh, services, it doesn't have to do with that relationship with, with other species because that would be considered as a function. But here I would, uh, I would interpret, interpret this as if, uh, as that total economic value, again, because under use values, we have direct use or indirect use, right? Direct use could be food, drinking, water. Indirect use could be flooding protection or carbon sequestration, et cetera. So I, I don't know if, if that was the intention of that column. Okay, thank, thank you, Marcello, for explaining that. I think I missed, understood the, the column. You suggested that column, but then, <laughs> then I, I mix it with the direct, or indirect has a food provisioning from other sports. So, uh, Robert, please. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just responding to to Rebecca's question, um, and again, I think it, it it really depends on on what um, what you need and want. But but I guess my perspective is that that broader uh, th there are a lot of of anthrop anthropocentric value, you know, human values 
that um, that are difficult to measure using economic means, but are but are nonetheless broadly accepted as valid and important. And cultural values are one of them. And so I would argue that 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 one would certainly want to include those. But I think that's just something that that you want to kind of clarify up front, right? Here's what we're including, right? We're including broad, you know, values, human values as a broader construct. That includes values that are easily, say, monetizable via economic or other methods, and others um, that are broadly recognized, but for which it may be challenging to, to quantify these in, in monetary terms, such as cultural, spiritual values, da 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 da. And, and as long as that's that's clear up front, then then there's no problem. The, the only the only time we've run into ambiguity is is where it's not really clear how we're defining value, right? Uh, are we including defining it solely as economic monetizable values? Or are we? I, and I would argue that we should define it more broadly. Thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, indeed, there are uh, the recreational values also from uh, whale watching, uh, which can be more easily measured from a, an economical perspective, but we are not intended to uh, include them uh, during this workshop, as it is, has been focused on the ecosystem functioning under uh, IWC, it already has a Whale watching subcommittee that is uh, working and has there is a lot of information and published information available on how this is value, but the functioning has not value. I think what we could uh, do for this workshop report is to include a paragraph or a, a chapter, a small chapter, where we recognize and acknowledge all these other values. But we uh, will focus on the ecosystem functioning, socioeconomic values that it's really uh, in the very earlier stage. And then the idea is to get this, uh, give a, a brainstorming about what, how far we can go with all these contributions. And I, I'm not sure if DJ has his uh, hand requested the the floor. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. I was uh, I was going to raise exactly what you just raised that we could insert a paragraph in the workshop report that explains you know all the potential values, but then clarify what we are attempting to capture in this workshop consistent with the resolutions. Uh, I also wanted to ask in regards to the suggestion to delete column K, um, I, I'm assuming there are uh, experts that will be participating tomorrow that aren't participating today. And so I'm wondering if we want to go ahead and delete this column or if there's some question as to whether it should be retained, should we put it in brackets and have a further discussion with the, with the other experts about this column tomorrow? I'm, I'm fine either way, I'm just asking. Thank you, DJ. I think that's a very interesting and a sensitive proposal. If uh, there is no objecting or there is support from the rest of the participant, I think we can also, of course, as we will be working on that, to have tomorrow a second review of this column and discussion with the other aspect, if we have time, because tomorrow will be very very uh, intense day two. So I think we are already running out of time. Um, we won't be able to go through this table today, but it is available at the SharePoint. I will ask a DJ if he could complement them with the new column on the SharePoint that we just developed and I will ask all the participants if they go through all the different threads to have an idea of what is the scientific committee identifying as contribution to the ecosystem uh, functioning. Hmm? And 
and we will be reviewing it next session uh, or the 11th session. So thank you everybody. Thank you very much for attending the workshop and a special thanks to Toshi, Davi and Marco for their excellent presentation and the Secretariat and Rapporteurs for their valuable work. It has Barbara, been an intensive day, yes? Barbara, just, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just one final question before we conclude. There was some discussion of um, sort of the, the spatial scale of the benefits. I'm just wondering if there's any interest in including a, another column that, dis, that, that would be um, described as what are the spatial scale of the benefits, local, global, so on and so forth. Is that necessary or is that unnecessary? Okay. Thank you, DJ. Yes, I have uh, some additional uh, hands. Uh, Sue? Yes, yeah, sorry, Barbara. You were, you were thanking people and I should echo those thanks and thank you. But just to ask, just to clarify, do you intend for us to be able to start to annotate this table in SharePoint? Is there a means for us to do that in, in comment mode or something so that you have something perhaps to start from tomorrow? Or do you want us just to look at it and think about it? Thank you. Yes, uh, to look at it. And if you can start feeling and annotate it, there is, I think, in the SharePoint, the possibility to comment it so you don't erase what the others did, but you your comments get uh, recorded and then we can uh, with the group review what is being filled in the table. Is uh, that answer to, to you, Stu? I think so. I have uh, Lorenzo's uh, raising hand. Yeah, Barb, first of all, thanks for chairing the meeting and to all the invited participants that presented today. I, I'm Lorenzo Rojas, I'm chair of the Conservation Committee for the International Whaling Commission. I, I was going to ask something similar to Sue, but also make a comment. And I, since they propose the beneficiaries, I have uh, struggled a bit with that. Uh, there, I, I had to take a call, so I couldn't follow all the discussion on that. But I think we don't want to complicate the table. And I would say that from DJ's suggestion, that might be good. I'm, it might be obvious just from who the beneficiaries are, if it's at a global scale or a local scale, and probably we don't need to add that other column. But I leave it to the experts to comment on that. Thanks. Thank you, Lorenzo. Has, uh, we are already past 10 past. Uh, one, um, I would suggest that we uh, leave this table as we work to today and we can come back to review it tomorrow if we have time or definitely we will come back on the day third, on the third day session on the 11th to rapidly check this, uh, this table, hopefully it will be uh, completed or half completed by that day. So we can focus also on the future research uh, needs and uh, management strategies that we can propose to the, to the commission. Barbara, I think you're on mute. Now, so you didn't hear what I was telling. <laughs> so I, I, I'm sorry. I would suggest that since it's 10 past uh, one already, 10 past one here, 10 past six in the UK, 
If we leave the table here, we can review it and have comments for next session if tomorrow we have time to review it. And if not, definitely on the third session day, on uh, Monday 11, we will come back to this table. Hopefully there have already people that is filling uh, with ideas the, the columns. So we can uh, already go through it very quickly because the third day we also will work on the recommendations and proposed strategies for the uh, conservation of cetacean and the socio-economic evaluation to present to the commission. So if this is okay with uh, all the participants, I will close now the session. If anyone wants to take the floor before that, please. Feel free, so it seems no. So let's tomorrow, let me see, I lost my notes for the day. Yes, uh, today was very intensive day and we will now stop the session. Tomorrow we will reconvene the 6th April at 15 hours UK time to continue with the workshop agenda. Tomorrow, we will have a series of presentations from additional highlighted experts on socioeconomic valuation to review existing techniques and identify methods to assess the contribution of cetaceans. It will be a very intense day as we have more five presentations. And we will be requesting also at the end of the day to form a small email group so we can summarize the outcomes of the first two days and advance on this uh, table and draft recommendation to be considered on day three. So if you want to volunteer tomorrow, we will have time at the end to uh, set up this uh, small group if, uh, if it's agreeable for the participants. So we can work on the day three from, uh, from something already draft. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the session, next session. Thank you.